So let's look at our objectives for today. We would like you to be able to describe the structure and function of reproductive systems in humans, describe the menstrual cycle, explain functions of various structures involving the developing fetus, and finally compare different birth control methods. Now, the reproductive system in humans is different to all other systems in the body, for example, digestive system, circulatory system, in that in the reproductive system, you have male and female parts. In all the other systems, they are the same regardless of your sex. So we're going to jump straight into the male reproductive system now. And we want to look at the structures. Now, this is a cross, a longitudinal section of the male reproductive system. And this is a side view. So we have cut the person down that way. And we want to, you should be able to name the various structures involved in the reproductive system of the man. Now, in the back here, at the back here, this is the end of the large intestines coming down to the anus. Okay? And the male reproductive system comprised of this part in the front here. So let's go ahead and label these. So at the base here, we have that sac that hangs outside the body, and this is called the scrotum. Inside of that scrotal sac or the scrotum, we have a very important structure known as the testis. Now, of course, males have two, but because it's a longitudinal section, you're only seeing one. So the testis contains the developing sperms, and the testis also um, secretes an important hormone called testosterone. There's a coiled structure here at the top of the testes, and this is called the epididymis. The epididymis is the structure that contains or stores the mature sperms before they are released. And when they are released, they go into this tube right here. And this tube is called the vas deferens. Okay, so let us follow the tube. I would use a different color. So sperms would leave the epididymis, travel through this tube, and enter or pass through this structure at the back. And this structure here is called the seminal vesicle. It is located behind the bladder. So the bladder is this structure here that is not strictly a part of the reproductive system, but it is a part of the entire structure in front here. So the seminal vesicle is behind the bladder. And of course, this is the, the area where urine is stored. You will notice that the bladder also empties into the same vesicle that is going to bring the sperms out of the body. Behind here, we also have another structure that is very important, and this is the prostate. Oops. This structure here, prostate. Now, do not get the word prostate confused with prostrate. To prostrate is to lie flat on the floor, um, face down. So it's not prostrate with the R here, it's prostate. And this prostate gland secretes substances or fluids into the vas deferens here. So the vas deferens has passed behind the prostate and is going to exit in this location. So the vas deferens, remember we passed this direction we pass through the seminal vesicle, it's going to pass behind the prostate gland and it empties into this column here. So the prostate gland is going to secrete substances into the sperms and then that creates what we call 
semen. So semen is a mixture of sperms and fluids secreted by the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, and this gland behind here called the corpus gland. Now the sperms are going to travel, continue on their way through the, the vas deferens, and when it enters into the penis, which is of course this part here, this tube is no longer called a vas deferens, it is now the urethra. So the urethra carries urine and the sperm out of the body and out through the head of the penis. So the diagram for the penis is quite complex, but the functions of the various parts are very easy to understand. So let us look at another diagram. This is also a longitudinal section, but it is a frontal view. So everything is already labeled here in this case. So we have some of the major organs already um, highlighted. So we have the testes, which you know we have two. Well, men have two. Then you have the epididymis, which is here. So sperms will travel up the vast difference on both sides, enter or flow through the seminal vesicles here, which will secrete a substance into the vesicle. So the, the vast difference, the, the seminal vesicles, sorry, are behind the bladder. So here is the bladder. The seminal vesicles are behind the bladder, and as the sperms pass through the tube, they secrete the substance into the tube, as well as the prostate gland also secretes a substance into that tube. So by the time the tube reaches down the length of the penis, it is called a urethra, and that is inside of the penis, and the sperms are going to come out through the head of the penis. So let us look at the various functions of the male reproductive system. The testes, we know, produces sperms, and an important hormone called testosterone. The epididymis, which is that coiled tube at the back of the testes, it stores the mature sperm until they are ready to be um, ejaculated out of the body. The sperm duct carries the sperm from the epididymis up eventually to the urethra. All of these glands here produce a fluid which is secreted into the vas deferens and that fluid and sperms, so sperms and seminal fluid is what we call eventually semen. The urethra allows these passes of sperms and the urine to pass out of the body. The both of them don't pass at the same time. The penis, of course, is that tool that is used to introduce the sperms into the female's body. And that is done for the purpose of reproduction. Remember, reproduction is about making a new organism of the same species. And the scrotum hangs outside of the body. And the reason for this is to maintain a lower temperature, lower than that is inside of the body, to keep the sperms at an optimum temperature for meiosis to occur. And you should know that meiosis is the process where those sperms are created, those male gametes. So let us move on now to the female reproductive system, and we'll do the same thing. Now the female system is much simpler to draw, but in terms of the functions of the various parts, it is a little more complicated because we are just complicated beings. Okay, so let us go ahead and label the various parts of the female reproductive system, at least those that you need to know at this level. So we will start with the, this um, egg-shaped structure here. It's called the ovary. And the ovary contains all the eggs or the ova that a female will need throughout her lifetime. She does not make new eggs every month. She's already born with all the immature follicles that she would need. The ovary, when an egg is released, is released into this tube 
on either side. And this tube is called the capital F fallopian tube. Depending on the source of your information, you may see the word oviduct. But we tend to use fallopian tube more. And at the start of the fallopian tube, you will see these finger-like projections here. These are called the fimbriae. These are the ones that waft the eggs into the fallopian tube. The fallopian tubes, both sides, so both fallopian tubes, lead into this inverted pear-shaped structure here known as the in long long time we'll say the womb but the biologically correct term is the uterus now the uterus is like i said it's pear shaped well, inverted pear shape it is a muscular organ and that uterus has two main parts. So we have the myometrium, which is the majority of the, the uterus. So let us say this side and that side. And then you have the endometrium. The endometrium is the thinner inner lining, which is here. This area here is the endometrium, and that endometrium is what is shed during the menstrual period. Okay, so let's continue with the labeling. So we have the uterus, which is this entire structure here. And then we have the vagina, which is the passageway in which where the, the penis will enter during sexual intercourse and this is where sperms will be deposited now at the top of the vagina but at the bottom of the uterus you have a ring of muscle right here this spot right here that i have the dot this is called the cervix so the cervix is this structure right here and that is the cervix okay so those are the major labels for the female reproductive system like i promised you it is much simpler than the male but in terms of the function is much more complex so let us look at the lateral view still a longitudinal section but this is a side view of the female reproductive system so once again we once you locate the ovary which is up here the ovary produces that those hormones estrogen and progesterone and from the ovary we have the fallopian tube so here the fimbriae the the finger-like projection that are going to move that egg into the fallopian tube so here we have the fallopian tube and then we have this inverted pear-shaped structure here this is the the uterus and i was pointing out to you before we have the uh, myometrium which is this structure here and the endometrium which is the that light light pink structure you're seeing there that is the endometrium of the uterus then we have of course the bladder and the urethra in females are two separate structures so here is the bladder that empties or urine is passes through the urethra here and outside the body so it's a different passageway to the vagina which is here so here is the vagina and here is the urethra at the back here of course is the end of the large intestines which empties into the anus so let us look at the functions of the different parts of the female reproductive system so we have the ovary the ovary as i said before produces egg um, plural ova and the ovary also produces estrogen and progesterone two very important hormones that are, that will come into play in a little while in the menstrual cycle the fallopian tube 
or the oviduct is the tube that transports the egg to the uterus and it is the place where fertilization would occur if if a sperm is present at the right time the uterus is where the implanted zygote will be placed and it is the place where the the, um, the embryo will develop so that's where the fetus will develop or the baby if fertilization takes place if no fertilization that is the part the lining also called the endometrium i pointed it out to you earlier that lining is going to shed or break away and pass all through the vagina if no fertilization takes place and the vagina is that organ that allows the entry of the penis and the sperms and it is the place where the baby passes out during the birthing process now i just wanted to place both reproductive systems side by side and you can see some major differences yes but there are a few similarities look at these you have these two egg-shaped structures here testes in males and ovary in females both of them lead into tubes so here's the vast difference for the males and the fallopian tube for females so you can see some structural similarities but there of course are very obvious differences between the two of them so we want to look at the menstrual cycle at this point in time we know that the menstrual cycle is this cyclical event that takes place once a month in a woman between the start of puberty and the start of menopause a woman will go through this menstrual cycle every month in preparation just in 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 the case that fertilization takes place it gets the body ready for a developing fetus so it is a hormone driven event and this is quite important it is a hormone driven event and it is divided into four main phases we have the menstrual phase so the menstrual phase is not the menstrual cycle the cycle has a big it doesn't have a beginning or an end but the menstrual phase is the part of active bleeding then you have the follicular phase where the follicles in the ovaries will develop then we have the ovulation phase which is the time when the egg is shed or the egg is released from the ovary and then we have the luteal phase so we're going to go through each of these phases and the whole process as i said takes about 28 days now each person or each woman's body is different so that the length of each of these phases is going to be different for every woman however the standard that we use is 28 days so we are going to use going forward in this lesson a 28 day cycle for ease of understanding and when we talk about menstruation we are also talking about the period otherwise known as the period so menstruation and menstrual cycle are two different things the menstruation is a part of the menstrual cycle so we want i'm going to take you through this thing step by step so the first thing we want to look at is what happens inside of the uterus itself so this is the uterus okay and let us look at so here is our cycle and we want to look at the days in the cycle so let us say this red the start of this red area is day one so here would be day seven we are moving in this direction so day one day seven here will be day 14 and we're moving in a cycle so here would be day 28 so what is happening inside of the uterus from day one to day seven we have active shedding of the endometrium so we have 
the breaking down of the walls or the lining of the endometrium and this endometrium would have been filled with blood vessels and tissues and um, creating a nice cushy environment just in case fertilization takes place. So if you have shedding or breaking down and this blood and tissue is going to come out through the vagina here. So this is the person is having an active bleed or they're having a period or a menstruation, right? So this is what's happening between days one to day seven. So at the end of day seven, we're going to have the lining is now going to just start to build up very slowly. So by day 14, we have the building up of the lining. As you can see, it is getting thicker. That's the endometrium here. You see in the red. So we have build up of new blood vessels, new tissues being laid on. So the endometrium gets thicker and thicker throughout the cycle. So by the time you reach day 28, the lining is at its thickest. As you can see here, the lining of the uterus is at its thickest. It, is, it has a rich supply of blood vessels and tissues all in preparation for a potential um, implantation of a developing um, fetus. I just want to point out here, I know in this slide we're talking about the uterus, but I just want to point out here, you may not have noticed, but around day 14, here we have, if you can see, we have a 1 over was released. See that yellow in the middle there? So around day 14, an egg is released. So let us see what that is about. So I'm now going to introduce to you what is happening in the ovary. So I've put an insert of the female reproductive system so that you can have an idea of what is going on. So on the outside, this is what is happening. We have day one to day seven. We have menstruation taking place. Around day 14, we have something called ovulation. And if you look here, we're talking about what is happening inside of the ovary at this point in time on the inside here. So while a woman or a young lady is having an active menstrual cycle going menstrual period sorry happening here inside of the ovary we have these follicles that have started to develop the follicles are going to start maturing or developing until it is it forms what is called a graphion follicle this follicle gets bigger and bigger, fills with a fluid. So you see the start of the fluid inside here, that blue liquid there. And while the graphene follicle is maturing, we have the egg is also maturing. So this yellow bit there is your egg. So if you look at it again, we have a developing follicle that gets slowly bigger even while the person is actively on their period so the body does not wait it's a cycle that just continues so by the time you reach the 13 we have a mature graphion follicle with a mature egg or ova that is ready for fertilization around day 14 this is the standard that we use. So halfway through the, the menstrual cycle, around day 14, we have that mature egg releasing from the graphion follicle. So here we have the mature egg here that bursts through the, bursts through the graphion follicle and enter into the fallopian tube, which would be here. So that happens around day 14, so remember, we're talking about inside of the ovary. What happens to this graphion follicle? Now, the graphion follicle, it has released the egg. So this mass of cells here, it forms and secretes a sort of yellowish substance. And this is called a corpus luteum. So your corpus luteum remains 
from day 16 all the way to day 28 but it slowly gets smaller and smaller as you go around the cycle so let us go that over again inside of the ovary what do we have happening during the menstrual cycle from day one you have development of the follicle and therefore development of the egg or the ova inside of the follicle this follicle is called a graphion follicle so as the cycle progresses we have the follicle getting larger creating more fluid and the egg on the inside is slowly maturing by the time we reach day 14 we have a mature matured egg that bursts through the graphion follicle and is released into the fallopian tube this is called ovulation the release of the egg into the fallopian tube the graphion follicle disintegrates into what is called a corpus luteum this corpus luteum releases a yellowish substance and as time progresses it turns it slowly gets smaller but it has a very important role that corpus luteum and it eventually forms what is called a corpus albicans but we'll get to that in the next slide so we have dealt with what is happening in the we have dealt with what happens in the uterus we have dealt with what happens in the ovary during the menstrual cycle so let us now talk about the hormones involved remember that the menstrual cycle is a hormone driven event so let us look at what the hormones are involved here now we have two sets of hormones those that control changes in the ovaries and these are specifically the gonadotrophin releasing hormone this is released from the hypothalamus of the brain thalamus of the brain then we have luteinizing hormone or lh and follicle stimulating hormone follicle stimulating hormone and the name of it gives you an idea what it does and these two hormones here are released from the pitu pituitary gland and that is in the brain so let us go over the hormones that control changes in the ovaries are the gonadotrophin releasing hormone and then we have luteinizing hormone luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone these affect the ovaries now hormones that control that control changes in the uterus are estrogen and progesterone so we have estrogen and progesterone so let us look now at how these affect the menstrual cycle okay so once again i've put an insert here to keep us on track so we have dealt with what is going on in the ovaries in the ovaries as time progresses so let's imagine that here is a time graph and this is day one here would be like day 14 and here will be day 28 okay so let us look at the graph and we look at this section first so from the dotted line to the left and we know that in the ovary or in the ovary so what is what happening in the ovary this section here we have the developing follicle and we also know that what is happening in the uterus from day one to day seven approximately no sorry day one to day seven will be around here we have the endometrium lining is slowly thinning out in other words the person is having a period the lining is shedding so it's going to get thinner between day one to day seven so let us look now at what is happening between 
this section here. We're looking at the hormones that are controlling this menstrual cycle. Now I'm going to take it step by step because I know it can be confusing, but we are going to hopefully unconfuse you today. So we talked about the pituitary hormones, hormones that are released from the pituitary gland, these two here, and how they affect the menstrual cycle. Now notice, on day one of the cycle, between days one to day seven, we have an increase in the follicle stimulating hormone, this hormone here, the follicle stimulating hormone. And what does a follicle stimulating hormone do? It stimulates or encourages the follicles to form. So these follicles here are going to be affected. So the pituitary hormones travel from the brain through the bloodstream and into the ovaries where they target the follicles inside of the ovaries. So these follicles are going to start to develop um, the graphium follicle that is, and the ova inside the graphium follicle, graphium follicle will begin to mature. At the same time, we have, if you look here, this hormone here, estrogen, slowly increases. So as FSH increases, estrogen slowly increases during this one day one to let's say day 12. So what is happening here? We have as the developing follicle continues to get larger, this follicle here secretes. In other words, the follicle that is developing inside of the ovary here secretes a hormone that affects the, the uterus. So, estrogen is released and that estrogen values slowly increase and if you look at what is happening in the uterus, we have a buildup. The lining in the uterus slowly starts to build. So estrogen is responsible for the building up of the lining in the uterus. So they're all linked. So FSH increases. It causes the follicles to develop. As the follicles develop, they will start to produce estrogen. So estrogen levels are going to slowly increase. And as the estrogen levels increase, the endometrium lining here begins to thicken. Okay, so that happens between days 1 to day 12. Let us look at what happens beyond that. So from day 12 to day 14, we have a drastic increase in another hormone, another pituitary hormone. So you will notice here that this luteinizing hormone here that is producing the pituitary gland remains rather steady until there is a drastic surge around day 14. Now why does this happen? Estrogen level rises just before day 14 and this triggers the pituitary gland to start releasing luteinizing hormone. So all the hormones work together. So we have estrogen here, drastic increase because the follicles are secreting estrogen and this estrogen causes the pituitary gland, so it's a negative feedback, to release a large amount of luteinizing hormone. This luteinizing hormone is responsible for ovulation here. It causes the graphium follicle to rupture and release that ovary, that ovum, sorry, release that ovum into the fallopian tube. So you will see a drastic increase in luteinizing hormone and then a drastic decrease all around day 14. So if you look here, that's what's happening here. 
Around day 14, you have ovulation. So what triggers ovulation? It's a drastic increase in luteinizing hormones. So you need to remember that. So let's continue. From day 14 onwards, of course, we have FSH decreasing. We have the luteinizing hormone also decreasing. But in the ovaries, or the hormones from the ovaries that affect the, the uterus, we have this hormone here. So you will notice from day one, let me use black, from day one, all the way through ovulation, this hormone was quite steady. The, vol the, the levels were low. And then drastically, you have this increase in this hormone called progesterone. So where did that progesterone hormone come from? What is happening in other parts of this di the reproductive system that causes drastic increase in progesterone? And that is the corpus luteum. So let's go back to what's happening in the ovaries. So we're back here again. The follicle has released the egg and the corpus luteum has developed. This corpus luteum secretes progesterone. And that is why you have this drastic increase in progesterone in the blood system. And what does progesterone do? Look at what is happening in the uterus. So we have estrogen was responsible for building up of the lining and progesterone is responsible for maintaining the lining. So let's go again. Estrogen here causes the lining to start thickening up. The endometrium has new blood vessels being laid down. It has tissues being laid down in preparation for developing fetus. And as estrogen levels increases, we have the, the lining continues to thicken. But then we have progesterone comes into play here. And progesterone is the maintaining hormone. It keeps that lining thick, prevents it from crumbling and preventing premature um, menstruation before time. Now, we do have some estrogen being released by the corpus luteum as well. So that is why you will see a little increase in the estrogen levels here. But the main hormone to maintain the lining is the progesterone hormone. So progesterone maintains the lining. And as the progesterone levels fall, you will notice that the corpus luteum gets smaller and smaller. So if the corpus luteum is getting smaller, it means less progesterone is being released and therefore the lining will start to shed and the woman will have a period. So progesterone levels fall, estrogen levels fall, the lining is no longer maintained, so the lining is shed through the vagina and the woman has her period on the start of day one here. These lowered levels of estrogen and progesterone now negatively feed back to the brain and the cycle begins all over again from this location. All right? So it is a cycle and it is hormone driven. Now, I know that we did a lot, but you just need to, if you can pause and rewind to go over the different steps that is happening. So let's um, look at it in its entirety very quickly again. So we have, let me just draw back. Good. So in the ovary, we have the developing follicle, the graphium follicle along day 14. We have ovulation where the egg is released and from day 14 onwards, we have the development of the corpus luteum. And this is what you call the corpus albican. Okay. Pituitary hormones. Let's look at that one. FSH increases from day one to day seven. And that FSH is responsible for the thickening of the endometrium lining. 
FSH falls, there's a slight increase during ovulation period, and then FSH continues to fall throughout the rest of the cycle. LSH, which is released from the pituitary gland, remains constant right until just before day 14, where there's a massive increase in the volume of luteinizing hormone, and this is responsible for ovulation. Luteinizing hormone falls drastically as well and remains constant until it gets the, the um, information to be released again. Ovarian hormones, hormones released by the ovaries are estrogen. Estrogen is released by the ovaries and targets the uterus. So estrogen causes the lining to thicken. So you will see the lining thickening in response to the increase of um, estrogen here. So the lining thickens. And then as you continue throughout the cycle, you have the amount of estrogen increasing slightly during the luteal phase and then it falls then we have the final hormone here is progesterone progesterone is the maintaining hormone so progesterone levels will remain constant until that corpus luteum here starts producing progesterone and that progesterone targets the lining of the uterus. So the progesterone maintains that nice cushy um, area with plenty blood vessels, plenty tissues, makes it ready for a developing fetus. Once the corpus luteum stops producing progesterone, obviously your progesterone levels are going to fall. And when progesterone levels and estrogen levels fall, the cycle begins again. This negatively feeds back to the brain and then we have the pituitary glands, the pituitary hormone secretes follicle-stimulating hormone again and the cycle goes again. <laughs>